We have an intuitive sense that some morphemes can stand by themselves as words, and other morphemes have to be squished on to the beginning or end or even the middle of a word to have any meaning. And in linguistics, these two fundamental types of morphemes are called bound morphemes and free or unbound morphemes. Free morphemes are the kind of morphemes that can stand by themselves. So they're called free because they can exist free of other morphemes. So think of a morpheme like book, perfectly happy to stand by itself. But it can also be combined with other bound or unbound morphemes. So you can combine it with a bound morpheme to get books, or you can combine it with another free morpheme to get something like bookworm or pocketbook. Pocketbook is made up of two free morphemes, pocket and book. Each can stand on their own, but they can also come together to make a word. Bound morphemes are a little bit more diverse. With bound morphemes, you get um, things like inflectional morphemes. So that's, in English, um, to mark the past tense, you add ed to go from talk to talked, or uh, the apostrophe s to mark possession, as in Sunil's house. All of these inflectional morphemes in English are bound morphemes. They can only be smushed onto words. They don't exist by themselves. Same thing with derivational morphemes. So things like ness, like happiness, or sadness, or itty. These are bound morphemes that change the part of speech, or the lexical category, of the word that they are attached to. Think of the suffix ology, like biology or psychology or physiology. It has a meaning. We all know what ology means when you add it to the end of the word, but that doesn't mean that it can stand by itself. So because of that, it's a bound morpheme. Even something like a vowel change is a kind of bound morpheme. So if I start with the word take, and I want to put it in the past tense by changing it to took, and I'll even gloss this in uh, International Phonetic Alphabet, you can see that that's a vowel change. The A vowel in the middle goes to the U. Uh, and you get a semantic change because of that. The meaning of the word is, is slightly different. Now it's in past tense. That's a kind of bound morpheme as well. A and U uh can't stand by themselves as words, but they're meaningful when they're in, inside of a word, in the context of a word. But I think every linguist's favorite type of bound morpheme is the cranberry morpheme. The legendary cranberry morpheme. Now, obviously, the word berry is a free morpheme. You could have berry by itself without cran or straw or blue attached to it at the beginning. But this morpheme cran is a bound morpheme that only ever exists in this context, in this very specific context, in front of the word berry. There's no other time in the entirety of the English language that cran comes up. It's just in the context of cranberry. Same with, uh, I don't know, boysenberry. Boysen only exists right in front of berry. It's, it's a bound morpheme with only one instance. And I think that's pretty cool. So another example would be something like Werewolf. Well, we know what a wolf is, but what exactly is a were? 
Well, it's a cranberry morpheme. Only exists in that one strange little context before wolf. So wolf is the free morpheme or the unbound morpheme, just like berry is. And then where and cran in werewolf and cranberry are the bound morphemes.